All right. Can everybody hear me? Awesome. Yep. So it's roughly about three o'clock. So if everybody could take a seat real quick, that would be awesome. Okay, so I'm here to introduce the second keynote speaker. It is Dr. Jonathan Patz. Um, Jonathan Patz is the director of the Global Health Institute at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is the Tony Michael Professor and the John P. Holton Chair of Health and the Environment with appointments at the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and the Department of Population Health Services. For 15 years, Patz has served as a lead author for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, the organization that shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore. He has also co-chaired the health expert panel of the U.S. National Assessment on Climate Change, a report mandated by the U.S. Congress. He is also an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. Pats is, committing, is committed to connecting colleagues from across campus and communities around the world to improve health for all and is endlessly striving to integrate his research into teaching for students and communication of policymakers and the general public. So without further ado, Dr. Jonathan Patz. Wow, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And also thanks for letting me zoom into this meeting. Uh, this is an extremely important audience. And therefore I jumped at the opportunity to be able to speak with uh, seniors and junior high school students, uh, because I my message is that uh, you know the climate climate crisis it's urgent we have to act on it, but I'm a I'm a public health scientist I'm an environmental public health scientist, and my mess main message is that acting on climate change why actions on climate change are also amazing health opportunities. So the title of my lecture, you know, Climate Actions, Amazing Opportunities for Health. Um, but first, um, you know, let's, we need to first define the problem. You know, I'm sure all of you know about climate change, which is now the climate crisis because it's so urgent that we act, that we act quickly. And, um, but this is where, this is the latest, United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And if you look at this, um, you know, how fast we are warming. This is over a long period of time, over 100,000 years on the, on the right, I'm sorry, on the left. But look at how fast our uh, warming is. And if you just look at this, the last uh, 170 years on the right here, you can see the rate of warming is way above anything that you would expect from natural climate variability. And just to take some quotes from the most recent UN uh, assessment, the IPCC report from last summer that came out, recent changes in the climate uh, are widespread, rapid and intensifying and unprecedented over thousands of years. It is indisputable that human activities, mostly burning fossil fuels, are causing climate change making extreme climate events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall, droughts, and, more uh, and droughts more frequent and more severe. And that unless there are immediate rapid and large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, it will be very hard to limit uh, warming the earth above one and a half degrees centigrade uh, from above industrial, uh, pre-industrial levels. So, you know, the rate of change is unprecedented. Uh, it's indisputable that humans are causing climate change. And, and now that we really need to act very quickly to reverse this. Um, I've worked on the IPCC for about 15 years and every report that comes out every five or six years gets more precise with the, the uh, acceleration of computing power and ability for climate models to at more accurately predict. So a long, you know, a while ago, it was not, we weren't sure if human pollution was causing climate change. Now it is virtually certain we are the problem by burning fossil fuels primarily. So when this report came out last summer, 
The um, Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Anthony Guterres, called this code red for humanity. And we are seeing, you know, up close, you know, we don't have to look very far. How about last, last summer, last June, when that heat wave hit the Northwest, you know, we saw record breaking temperatures uh, that they'd never seen in the Northwest, uh, across Washington state and Oregon, British Columbia and Canada, um, deaths from heat waves. You saw pictures of vinyl siding melting off of houses. Um, and also, of course, when you combine heat and drought, um, we saw record-breaking wildfires across the West. Uh, and the smoke from wildfires is very dangerous. And it's not just limited to that area. We saw um, you know, smoke from those wildfires even in Wisconsin. Uh, and I remember being outside um, and seeing very orange sunsets because of the smoke. And it's not just uh, something about, you know, the looking at sunsets, but it's damaging to our lungs. And this, this uh, study out of the journal Pediatrics showed that wildfire smoke is really bad for breathing. Uh, you know, children, uh, their respiratory systems were uh, exas it, it was damaged uh, worse than other types of fine particle pollution. Uh, PM 2.5 is very, very fine particulate matter. PM is particulate matter. 2.5 is uh, 2.5 microns. That's 10 times smaller than the diameter of one hair follicle. Of course, I don't have many hairs left, but if you were to take one hair follicle, one tenth of that diameter, that's the size of these particles we're talking about, that can get deep into the lungs and cause all sorts of uh, problems and even uh, uh, cardiac problems as well. So these fine particles are very, very dangerous. So many times you have an extreme heat wave or a flood or some, disaster, some climate disaster. And the question has always been, well, are we sure that you know, global warming, you know, burning greenhouse gases and forcing the earth to warm up, how much of that extreme event was related to global warming? So now with the computer capacity, uh, there's a, this World Weather Attribution Initiative that is able in real time to look at a particular event, an extreme weather event, and say how likely it was with or without uh, human-induced warming of the planet, you know, climate change. And that major heat wave, which was so extensive in geographic area and lasting over a long period of time, it was called a heat dome. We've had a couple of these. And frankly, I had never myself heard of the term heat dome until maybe two years ago when we had a heat dome across the United States, just when COVID began. And um, yeah, so that heat dome was made about 150 fold more likely of happening uh, because of climate change. And that without you know, human induced heating up of the planet from burning fossil fuels, an event as extreme as happened in the Northwest last summer was virtually impossible of happening. So we are starting to see these events that are very extreme and are able to put a signature and attribute them to you know, our forcing the planet's climate to uh, get warmer and warmer. Um, in real time, you know, just last week uh, or a couple of weeks ago, you can see, you know, when you search Google for the drought and the, the drought that's happening now, it's the worst in recorded history. So right now in the Southwest, uh, that drought has never, it has never been as bad as it is now. So when we think about climate change, and it's these three physical attributes of uh, rising temperatures, 
sea level rise because of thermo expansion of salt water and hydrologic extremes, extremes of the water cycle, more droughts, floods, and fires. Because think about when, when do we get our heaviest thunderstorms? It's when the temperatures are really hot. So when you start getting 95 degrees centigrade days, I'm sorry, 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 30, 33 degrees centigrade, that, that type of temperature, that energy in the atmosphere drives thunderstorms and it rains harder because hot air holds more moisture. So when it rains, it can rain really hard. And with hot temperatures, of course, you're drying out the soil. So it's, you can have droughts and floods at the same time because of climate change. So my, where I come from, because I'm a public health scientist working with climate scientists, you know, I asked the question, well, how many health outcomes and diseases are sensitive to climate? And if you look at this green box, you know, these are all the different pathways through which climate affects our health. So direct effects from heat waves. And in a city, when you have black asphalt um, roads and concrete buildings that retain heat, you can get an intensification of heat in the urban core. And it's called the urban heat island effect. I'm gonna show you uh, an example of the urban heat island effect in the next slide. Of course, air pollution, you think about heat waves, stagnant air masses, um, hot temperatures actually form more smog ozone, the brown smog haze, which is uh, brown, it was ozone, that's temperature sensitive but also infectious diseases, especially um, vector-borne diseases. These are diseases carried by insects. Think about malaria that's carried by mosquitoes or um, Zika virus that's also carried by mosquitoes. So um, vector-borne diseases are very sensitive because mosquitoes are cold-blooded, uh, so are ticks. So any cold-blooded organism, it's, transmission dynamics are related to the temperature because the body temperature of that mosquito is the same temperature as the air temperature that surrounds her. Waterborne diseases, thinking about extremes of the, of the water cycle, hydrologic cycle, uh, more flooding, more contamination, so waterborne diseases. And of course, we know that our health depends on adequate water and food supplies and that could be threatened with climate change. Um, this last one, mental health and environmental refugees, um, thinking about droughts uh, that hit Syria right before the Syrian civil war, those droughts were the worst in their instrumental record and the rural to urban migration rates in Syria right before their civil war were four times higher, four times faster, more migration into cities uh, than normal. There were food price shocks because of the, the extreme drought effects on, on crop yields. There were riots in the street. So one question is, did the Syrian civil war and all of the hundreds of thousands of people that died from in that war, the millions of refugees that were forced out of Syria, was that related to, to this extreme drought? Um, it's, a, it's an open question, but these are things that we need to think about. And, and personally, this issue of uh, environmental refugees, forced migration, um, I think it's the, the iceberg under the tip of the iceberg. I think this could be a hugely uh, unsettling problem. I know the Defense Department is worried about climate change and, and, and national security uh, for this reason as well. So because of all of these different pathways through which climate affects our health, I'm gonna show you just a couple of these case studies of different diseases and different health outcomes related to extremes in climate. And the first one is heat waves. And I mentioned the urban heat island effect that the core of a city with lots of you know, black asphalt roads and concrete buildings uh, absorb the heat the unfortunate 
problem also compounding heat waves and, and the urban heat island effect is that our, our racist past um, is related to today's risk from, from dying in a heat wave. And this is a map, um, this was published in the New York Times. This is the city of Richmond and everything, all these red outlined areas were literally red lined neighborhoods. Now, I don't know if you know much about red line neighborhoods, but it's a good day to talk about it because today is Juneteenth um, when we celebrate the end of slavery you know, formally. And so this is a perfect day to, to raise this topic. It used to be that um, in, in an urban, in a urban center, you would, you would classify neighborhoods, different colors, you know, green, yellow, red. If you were in, you know, red meant um, very low, um, low value areas. They may be areas right next to highways or factories. Um, and they were just not great places to live. And there were unethical racist practices in the way that we zoned neighborhoods and wouldn't allow African Americans to actually buy a house in certain places, completely um, racist practices. And so, you know, you weren't even allowed to buy where you wanted to, to live necessarily, even if you could afford it. And so these, these red line zones are very um, undesirable places to live in a city. And uh, uh, poor community, African-Americans especially, were forced to, to live in these places. They had to live there or nowhere else in the city. Well, guess what? Those neighborhoods are the highest risk of having super hot temperatures in a heat wave that hits that city. And you can see that, you know, this heat map, you know, the red lined areas are places where they have the worst heat, probably because there are no parks, because parks were, you know, they were granted for higher end neighborhoods. And you know, the red line neighborhoods, that's where you would build a highway or, you know, so it was really terrible what, what has happened. And this has um, been going on for a long time, but this is now relevant to risk in a heat wave. So shifting gears a little bit, but I wanna come back to racism in just a second. Um, remember that it's not just about temperatures, it's about extremes of the hydrologic cycle. And if you look at the United States, um, everything with these black hash marks are statistically significant wetter places, um, especially in the summertime. So, um, but also spring as well. And we see in Wisconsin, we, we now have seven inches more rainfall than we did 50 years ago. And there's a whole list of health out impacts from that. I'll just tell you one that we studied um, looking at water quality for Chicago, by the middle of this century, in the next few decades, that we'll see much more heavy rainfall events, so much so that the water systems can't handle the, the storm overflow, the, the storm water. And there are many systems in the United States that still combine um, so, um, sewage and storm water. Some places are they're separated, but it costs billions of dollars to really do it well. So there are many of communities that if it rains too hard, you're gonna have sewage contaminated stormwater overflowing into lakes and streams. And it happens today already. We have over a trillion gallons of sewage contaminated uh, stormwater that overflows into our surface water. It's gonna get worse. And our, our estimates that this could be doubling, we'll have double the number of these combined sewage overflow events because of very heavy rainfall. And when you see flooding, you know, if you're in the emergency room, you know, you would expect to see uh, water issues, maybe diarrheal disease and drinking water issues, but that's not what they see in the ER after a flood. They see asthmatics. Why do you think you would see asthma patients in the emergency room after a flood? Well, 
you know, this is what a basement might look like after a flood and thinking about repeated flooding and more this becoming more frequent, more severe, this is a huge issue. And yet again, you know, a racist past, a flooded future, formerly red line areas are at much higher risk. You know, they're probably more in floodplains, in low, low desirable areas. And so yet again, here's another um, risk factor that is it's a, an equitable equity issue as well. Well, um, okay, so mold likes to grow in wet places. Um, there are lots of crops that we're going to be that are not going to do well with climate change, and it's estimated that we'll see a uh, 800, uh, 800 um, million more people that are at risk for food insecurity. But some plants will benefit. Poison ivy and ragweed will do just fine with higher temperatures and more CO2 in the atmosphere. And this is showing that uh, at high latitudes, especially like Wisconsin, our ragweed pollen season is 13 days longer. Uh, so we're gonna see asthmat asth asthmatics have more problems with climate change. And finally, uh, as people argue that the greatest risk may come from the smallest organisms, you know, as I mentioned, Mosquitoes are cold-blooded, whatever, whatever the air temperature is, that's the body temperature of that mosquito. So this particular mosquito, Aedes aegypti, carries viruses. It carries yellow fever virus, dengue fever virus, and Zika virus. And right before Zika virus emerged and became a, a big regional epidemic, um, we had a very strong El Nino event. And this is a colleague of mine here at UW-Madison, Dan Weimont, who showed the temperatures uh, in, in, throughout Brazil and Colombia where Zika virus erupted. These temperatures were extremely hot, um, hotter than two standard deviations above a 60-year constructed average. Super hot temperatures, and guess what? The ability of that mosquito to transmit disease is called the vectorial capacity. You know, if there's one patient that has that disease, you know, the, that virus in their blood, how likely is it for mosquitoes to turn one case into more cases of human, you know, human disease? So the, the vectorial capacity, you've also heard about it with uh, COVID, uh, it's called Rho. You know the the you know how 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 many more cases does one case lead to? So this vectoral capacity, we're dealing with vector-borne diseases. So it's called vectoral capacity, it was at its highest level uh, in the last sixty years when Zika virus erupted. Because Zika is the same family as dengue dengue fever, which is the the most widespread mosquito-borne virus in the world. Um, it's the same family virus. It's the same mosquito vector. I told people, you know, whatever dengue fever does with climate variability, so will Zika. But I had to be corrected because it turns out that in the laboratory, Zika virus, uh, the, the temperature optimum for Zika virus is five degrees warmer than, than dengue. So it's possible that that extremely hot wintertime, the El Nino of 2015, may have really contributed to Zika taking off as it did. So that's the problem uh, from the health point of view. And so in 2015, at the Paris summit, you know, every year there's a conference of the parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And so in 2015, that was the 21st meeting of the Conference of the Parties. And that meeting had more heads of state show up in one place at one time ever in history. I think you had 143 heads of states, presidents, prime ministers, not vice presidents, you know, like the heads of states. So Paris was a big deal. And out of the Paris Agreement, the world leaders said, okay, we really 
want to stay below the, the two degrees threshold warming that, that all the scientists are saying, hey, you go above two degrees warming above pre-industrial levels, ecosystems are gonna collapse, everything's gonna break down, it's gonna be a disaster. Well, they said, well, okay, let's have a little safety. What would it take to stay below one and a half degrees warming? One and a half degrees centigrade average global warming above pre-industrial levels. So they asked us, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to run analysis. And so here's the stark news is that to stabilize at one and a half degrees centigrade, we would have to cut emissions almost in half, 45% by the end of this decade. So eight years from now, we have to cut emissions in half, almost in half, and get to net zero by 2050. So we're talking mostly about getting off of fossil fuels, but also you know, cutting deforestation and losing that carbon sink from large trees is also the problem. So deforestation, but primarily burning fossil fuels, we have to cut this back by almost half. And that's an emergency. So no surprise, I know that you all know Greta Thunberg, and this is um, in August of 2018, she was sitting out in, uh, in front of the Swedish parliament building with her sign that says schools strike for climate and you know, speaking truth to power and really being focused on this, she really got a tremendous attention that was ex 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 you know, absolutely well, well deserved and needed and necessary. There she is with the Pope. Here she is telling the US Congress to wake up and quit talking about doing something and actually do something. And so, you know, it's a climate crisis, it's an emergency. But here is my message. And it's a message that I want you to really come away with. Um, if you're gonna come away with one thing from this, this lecture, and that is that, you know, from a public health point of view, combating climate change could be free or even a net benefit. And so I've been publishing about climate change challenges and opportunities, solving the global climate crisis, the greatest health opportunity of our times, a low carbon future could improve global health and achieve economic benefits and that climate solutions double as health interventions. So it's a depressing situation we're in and yet it is an, an absolutely a golden opportunity. And we, I think we really need to show uh, how much of an opportunity there is. For example, um, these three big sectors to the right of the dotted line, so electric power generation, uh, food systems, and transportation. Just let's look at those three big ones. Well, electric power, think about how many people die from air pollution. If you're burning coal to gener generate electricity, all the, the dangerous pollution, especially the fine particles, PM 2.5, it kills people. Seven million premature deaths every year. Uh, that's how many people die prematurely from air pollution. So no brainer, get to clean energy, save lives. The food sector, you know, we don't have the healthiest diet, really, the Western diet. And if we were to reduce our level of red meat and increase fruits and vegetables and eat more, eat lower on the food chain and follow something that's called the universal healthy reference diet, that would save 11 million lives every year. And finally, when you think about the, the automobile, um, it's estimated that from the private automobile, just that, that physical inactivity and the lack of opportunity to move around by active travel from biking, walking, using mass transit and walking, 
you know, the over reliance on a private private automobile um, is estimated to lead to almost four million premature deaths every year. If you added all these numbers, seven million, eleven million, four million, you know, we're talking about almost half of premature deaths every year. So, you know, this is fantastic news when you realize, hey, you know, it's it's something we ought to be doing. It's it's great for our health anyway. Uh, one quick note about COVID and air pollution. You know, your risk of dying from COVID if you catch it, if you're hospitalized with COVID, um, looking at North America and East Asia, if you're in a polluted city, you have a 14 or 15% risk of dying from COVID. So getting COVID, which affects the lungs, plus air pollution is a higher risk of dying from COVID. This is a map uh, in the United States looking at coal-fired power plants. So burning coal for our electricity. You can see the Ohio River Valley, especially. These are areas that are greatly affected by air pollution. And um, it's estimated that, you know, if you got rid of these, you would save um, lots of, I think, you know, lots of lives. And this is a study that was released just last year showing that in the United States, there, you know, from pollution, uh, there are over 100,000 people that die from pollution, even in our country that has a wonderful Clean Air Act. Um, so we need to get rid of these uh, dirty sources um, pretty quickly. I mean, I, my argument is, well, I'll just say one thing. We can't burn coal anymore. We, we need a, a dr just transition so we absolutely need to invest in coal mining communities. We need to support coal mining communities and those people, but we cannot burn any more coal. We cannot afford to burn any more coal. And when you think about uh, you know, getting to clean energy, there's this argument, well, that takes technology. You know, we need to burn, you know, we need to put scrubbers on smokestacks, we need cleaner fuels it might cost $30, you know, to avoid, you know, one ton of CO2. If we don't want to burn one ton of CO2, it might cost $30. And so people say, well, we don't want to pay anything more for energy. But if you don't burn a ton of coal, you also don't release all the other nasty pollutants like sulfur dioxide, lead, mercury, nitrogen dioxide and fine particles. And if you just look at the fine particles, you know, the, for every ton of CO2 that you don't emit, your reduction in fine particles would equate to $200 in health benefits from avoided death and hospitalization. And so, you know, I ask decision makers and I'll ask all of you a very hard question, which number is bigger? 30 or 200. And, you know, it's obvious. And they're only, the policymakers are only focused on the $30. They don't want to pay more up front. And they're forgetting about the incredible benefits of society. And um, so it's, it's um, something that we really need to be pushing hard. Um, by the way, this number 30 might be wrong. It's probably a lot less. Um, have any of you followed the price of solar energy lately? Did you know that, that solar energy has dropped 300 times in the last 40 years? It's dropped 89% in just the last 10 years. And according to the agency that looks at uh, energy, you know, this is a renewable energy agency, for the first time ever, Three years ago, if you remove all subsidies, you know, get no government subsidies for any, any energy, any power generation, okay? So nobody gets any money from the government. If you were to do that, the cheapest way to generate electricity today or since 2019 is with renewable energy and batteries. That's brand new. Um, I was at a lecture 
And next to me was a very conservative individual. And he says, he told, he said in his lecture, he said, I am a conservative Republican that believes in free market. And right now, the cheapest way to generate electricity is for renewables. Uh, it's not a political thing. It's an, it's a market thing. I am a hundred percent for renewable energy and for pushing it. So if you take politics out of this, and if you just focus on economics, um, this was not true five years ago, but now solar wind is so much cheaper that there's absolutely no reason whatsoever to not move forward and, and quickly decarbonize our energy sector. We uh, published last month a paper that asked the question, if we were to remove um, carbon in energy across sectors in the United States, what would the benefit in reduction of fine particles, PM 2.5, what would it be? Um, this was the uh, headlines in the Washington Post from our study uh, that cutting, you know, if we were to remove fossil fuels for energy generation, you'd save, the actual number is 53,000 lives every year. So a golden opportunity, you know, get to clean energy, it saves lives. And this is, this is sort of a map, you know, the darkest blue is where you get the most benefit. And depending on the sector, like electricity, you can see the, the greatest gains are in this area, the Ohio River Valley, the Mid-Atlantic region, Transportation, lots in California, lots of cars in California, great benefit there. This is looking at um, uh, oil and gas production and refining down in Louisiana and Texas. So depending where you are and depending on what sector you decarbonize, you get, you get the benefit from cleaner air. Okay, let's shift gears. I'm only gonna speak briefly about the food and transportation sector and then wrap it up. Um, this is a really important um, report that came out of this medical journal, The Lancet, um, the food in the Anthropocene. That's, you know, we're in the human error. Anthropocene is human error. That's because humans affect everything on earth now. And this re commission report talked about sustainable food systems. I'm only gonna show one uh, image, one graph from this table, uh, from this report. Um, this looks a little bit complicated, but it really isn't. Um, if you think about this bar chart, everything to the right of this dotted line, the shaded areas here, that's food that we should not be eating. You know, if we weren't eating this, it would be a lot healthier. We'd be a lot healthier and the environment would be uh, better protected. So certainly we eat way too much red meat, starchy vegetables like corn, um, and these other ones as well. So if we were to get to this, what they call the universal healthy reference diet, it's a diet that most of you know, probably already, you know, it's more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, unsaturated oils, you know, a little bit of seafood, very little um, poultry and, and practically just a tiny bit of red meat. You know, you don't have to go vegan, just, eat way less red meat and these things and, and you'd be better off. And what would that do? That would save 11 million lives every year and be an incredible benefit for the environment. Thinking about the amount of crops that we grow for cattle, for livestock and the water demands and the land demand, deforestation in the Amazon to, to grow livestock, the energy demands and fertilizer. So, just there's just enormous energy and um, environmental destruction that happens when we're, we're eating too much red meat. Now, there are some new solutions. Uh, the other problem with, with livestock is methane production. And, um, you know, because of, um, you know, the digestion uh, in, in uh, cows that they end up belching methane, believe it or not. And methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. There's new, a new study that's showing you can reduce 80 to 90% of that methane by chopping up seaweed, you know, kelp and seaweed and putting it into livestock feed. So there may be some solutions 
uh, we ought to be trying that with our dairy industry here in, in Wisconsin, I think. Finally, talk about transportation. If you look at cities with the highest rates of walking and biking compared to those with the lowest, you see you know, these diseases like diabetes and uh, overweight and obesity in, in much lower numbers. Um, but also exercise, it doesn't, you're not just burning calories uh, with exercise. When you're exercising, contracting muscles are chemical factories for really good enzymes and protective uh, uh, proteins in, in, your, in your body that reduce the risk of heart disease, cancer, dementia, depression. So, you know, we all know how valuable exercise is to our health. But if you look at uh, nationally, what's the average bike ability in the country? Well, the national average is only 1% down here. If you got to the level of biking in my city of Madison, Wisconsin, right here, that's 6% biking, that would save, that exercise would save 20,000 lives a year. If you got to Boulder, Colorado at 10%, that saves 30,000 a year. And if you got to the level of Amsterdam, Holland, you know, so much 40% of bicycle commuting, you know, you're saving 70,000 lives a year. Now, urban planners need to design cities that are safe for biking. So I don't tell people, you know, go out in the streets and bike and get exercise if it's dangerous. So this is where we need to put pressure on, on urban planners. And we have something it's called uh, complete streets. It's a policy that says, if you're gonna build a street, it's gotta be uh, completely safe for all modes of travel, walking, biking, and automobiles, and ideally mass transit too. But this idea of building safe uh, travel infrastructure so we can have more active travel from walking and biking. So um, finally, uh, just to talk about one last thing, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, urban green space. That when you think about heat waves, you know, that are harmful for our health, uh, there's also something to do with, you know, reducing the urban heat island, having more green space. But green space has its own virtues for reducing disease risk. And green space is related to uh, reducing depression, stress, and anxiety. This study came out of the city of Milwaukee and um, you know, significant reductions in anxiety, stress, and depression, depression. We're talking about levels on par with the stress of moving or the stress of divorce. You know, the, some of the biggest stress uh, events that we know about, you know, green space is that impactful. And of course also, no neighborhood social cohesion, reductions in crime and violence. You know, green space has some all sorts of benefits. And I'll just show this one study out of Denmark that showed wherever, no matter where you live, these, these different charts are showing like a rural, you grew up in a rural area or a small town or, or a small city or a suburb of the capital or even in the capital city. You know, wherever you grew up, you know, there is an inverse relationship between your exposure to green space and ever developing a psychiatric disorder. So the more green space you grow up with as a kid, the less likely chance you have of getting any kind of psychiatric disorder. So it's a big deal. So I want to conclude by you know, keeping it simple, you know, simple messages repeated often. Um, five truths to know about the climate crisis, uh, what we used to call global warming. Um, you can just say it in 10 words. It's real. And, and the latest IPCC assessment 
shows the certainty that it is absolutely scientifically real. It's us. This is the other thing that it's like, no longer are we questioning how much influence does burning fossil fuel have on the global climate? It's like, yes, the climate scientists that are studying this, they all agree. So it's real, we're causing it, it's us. And experts agree, okay, that's the third one. The experts agree. Uh, it's bad. I showed you why climate disasters are really harmful, but that there's hope and that there are amazing opportunities uh, to, from a low carbon society, great opportunities, but also the fact that we don't need to wait for a miracle when you look at the price of renewable energy. And, you know, we can very easily electrify much of the global economy, not all of it but much of it. Uh, and there's also, uh, as far as storage, uh, there's, um, there's research in hydrogen for storage, batteries are getting better. You know, there's still a lot of work to be done, but it's not, you know, we don't need to wait for a miracle. We just need to uh, mobilize and, and reach some political will. Uh, that's really the only thing I think that's the highest priority now. So I'll conclude by saying that today, more than ever before, we are incredibly well positioned to solve the climate crisis. And my message in this keynote is that, you know, in so doing, uh, our health will enormously benefit in the process. So with that, um, I thank you for your attention. And there's, you can follow me on Twitter, just at my last name, Jonathan, or my full name, Jonathan Patz. And uh, I am open for questions. And again, thank you for letting me uh, zoom in instead of uh, needing to drive over to where you are, but because it sounds like a wonderful uh, week that you're having. But thank you very much. And um, I'll take down my slides and open up for questions.